she had young kids. I didn't have a lot of, I, I mentioned that in a draft, but there wasn't a lot about it. And my um, um, editor asked, like, give us an image. Like, what was that like? This, this you know, young mother toting around the, with these kids. And uh, I can't remember how I found it, if it was from an interview with her or I got pointed to some sort of class recollection where a classmate recalled that she, when she showed up to class, she was driving a, a, a beat up Honda and the, and the back seat was strewn with Cheerios. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> so, so, it, so at the urging of a smart editor, I found that and inserted it. Stuff like that. Certain things get richer, other things get trimmed. But the structure, I mean, the first chapter is the first, the sequence. If this sort of seems familiar, it's because that's, that's the chapter. We've got some in several of them over here. So, the life of this wire. So, you'll have to either come up this way, if you can't reach you, or project. Why am I saying this? I can come this way. <laughs> Hi, Nick. And I have to say, we go back to Conan School. Aww. Oh, yay! Yeah. <laughs> remember you when you were little. <laughs> Don't tell anyone anything. <laughs> Not a thing. All, all good anyway. Um, I, I have to admit that when I started the book, I thought, oh God. But I couldn't put it down. And so congratulations for that. Thank you. You have set your bar awfully high for having such success with your first book. Do you fear that that's going to get in the way of your writing another book? Or well, I do now. <laughs> yeah. to, you know, to meet your own expectations, I should think it would be hard. Um, I mean, put me in a situation and I will find something to worry about. <laughs> but I, one thing I'm conscious of is, um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm a better writer now than when I published the book. I mean, I've written more stories, I've improved. So I don't so much worry about sort of quality. There, I do, there is, I have this awareness that my first book was such a big swing in terms of social significance. I mean, what if I want to write a book about sports? What if I want to write a book about uh, a musician? And it, it's not this sort of epic social uh, story. Will that be a kind of let, will people think I sort of took an easier route? And in fact, that wouldn't be it. I just, I have a lot of interests. And not everyone is like this sort of big in social import. I do sort of have that on my brain, but I also basically think if I have the privilege of a career, a life in and around books, uh, as was quoted earlier, then I should do, pursue the work I want to do to the best of my ability. And people can think what they think. I will try to do right. I mean, I want people to love my books. I never said before, thank you to the book club who chose the book. Um, but you've also got to kind of follow your own vision, I think. And um, so I'm kind of determined to do that. And I think if I do that, to the best of my ability, I'll probably be okay. Bravo. I really enjoyed the book, but I have a couple of questions. And I got here late, so I apologize. What's Willie doing these days? Is he? He's doing well. Okay. He's living in Lawndale, North Carolina. Um, I actually have to check him because he gets bad seasonal allergies. And so I usually call and check in to see how he's doing uh, like when the season changes. Um, he likes to go on these walks. He lives next to a school, which is kind of significant because when um, he couldn't originally do that because he was a, registered, a, a, a wrongly registered sex offender, so he couldn't. Um, so it's kind of significant to me that he lives right next to a school. And he goes and he walks laps around the track, and he can't do it when, uh, like right after it rains or anything because he has bad pollen allergies. But other than the allergies, he's doing well. Um, yeah. uh, so, reading the book, the thing that struck me was that Willie never did anything wrong. Did he ever do anything wrong? 
in prison. There was always some excuse for everything that happened to him. Was he a perfect person? No. And that was that was the theme that I got reading the book. I kept feeling like poor Willie. You know, this was just it just it was just a theme for me. I don't know if anyone else felt that way, but just I, yeah. every time something he was accused of something, there was always some excuse for it. I don't know. Just was it at one time where he did have some wine? Like, he had yeah, two DWIs, I guess. Yeah. That was his. The only yeah. Thing. Also, in prison, they made I forget what they called it. Uh, there's kind of like prison wine they made from yeah, fermenting some fruits or something. He got busted. Um, I mean, I certainly don't think Willie's perfect. I, I also don't think Willie would say he's perfect. Um, I think that um, I think that in his I mean I think for example Willie perceived uh, if you ask Willie he would say that he felt he was too sort of egotistical and reckless in his youth um, he thinks he, he, he drank too much um, uh, and he, he sort of regrets that. Um, he, he thinks his sort of priorities weren't right in his youth, which I will say, sound, I mean, is not a sentiment that struck me as unique to Willie. I think a lot of people, as they grew up, have that experience. I do, and I'm 32. Um, I also think that Willie perceived his, um, Willie's initial emotional experience in prison for the first few years, he looks back on with real, I don't think regret is the word, but um, real distance. It's almost like him, I think, looking at a different person. Because he was so rageful, he was so angry, he was so mad, he was so corrupted and poisoned by fury. And the Willie of today views that as a real sort of human flaw. That he could be pushed to such a brink. Now, from my perspective, that seems contextually pretty understandable. Um, but he views it as... Um, I don't know how to, that's something he did wrong, but um, at a very imperfect moment. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It, was just, it just seemed like it was a theme that, you know, he was always in the wrong place or did the wrong thing, and, but was not to blame for anything. So yeah, I, I mean, it turns out that that was also, a, that was a theme in his life. Yeah. So that's not just a theme in the book, that's a, yeah. that's a fact of his life. I mean, you'll, you'll know that it's a book about a guy who was wrongly convicted. Yeah. Um, and in, in legal terms, you know, um, there's, a, there's a legal term called actually innocent. And uh, that whole phrase, actually innocent, and what that means is someone who uh, had absolutely, literally zero, nothing to do with a crime. It's different from not guilty. Um, if you were uh, the getaway driver for a murder, you're, you're not guilty of the murder, but in legal powers, you are not actually innocent. You were, com you were complicit in a part of that. Willie uh, was l legally actually innocent. He had nothing to do with this. And so maybe, that's, um, maybe that explains part of your experience. Uh, just one quick last thing. Um, the person that got the reward for turning him in, was the that neighbor. a relative of his, Linda? Was Linda that McDowell, not... Yeah, not she a... really wasn't brought up in the, in the book until the end, in the very beginning, so what was, what was her deal? Uh, was she a relative? Just a... I not of Willie's. I couldn't follow that. Um, she wasn't about to be no. that was, That's what it was all about. I think people are complicated. Mm -hmm. And Linda answers, is asked that question under oath, and there are scenes in the book where she answers that question under oath, and I, I 
sort of don't think I have an answer that is bet more insightful into her motives than she gives. I mean, certainly I tried to um, address that in the narrative. That's sort of all I can say. And that was one interesting alibi, too, that he had. I mean, all the things that he did to put him where he was at that night at the scene of the crime, it was just really so interesting. I'm glad you liked the book. Yeah, no, I really did enjoy Thank it. You. I have two questions, um, first of which is, why this story? Um, there are a number of uh, men of color or people of color who have been accused for crimes they never committed. Um, so what drew you to this story? And then the second one is, you as a white man, at least a white appearing man, um, how did you approach this book in relationship to racism and even the white savior complex in relationship to you writing the story? Because um, I feel like it could be picked up in a different ways depending on the communities. Sure. Um, the reason for this guy was that um, I was in North Carolina um, in the imme immediately following his exoneration. And so um, there was a proximity to this story. Um, there was also um, a sort of personal element, which is that I, I'm the middle of three brothers. And the age gap between me and the younger is two years. And I was 26 when I learned that Willie had just been exonerated after 24 years in prison. And that two-year gap meant that my younger brother was 24. So Willie had spent my younger brother's entire lifetime in prison. <coughs> and there was a resonance to that that really blew me away. And so it was sort of a, a right place, right time kind of thing that really stirred me to, to pursue the story, and I thought it was dramatically interesting in all these ways, partly actually having to do with um, what the previous uh, speaker was talking about, which is that he was so visibly and dramatically not guilty, and that stark contrast made him a really um, interesting character um, to tell this story. Um, in terms of my race, um, and it's not just race. I mean, um, you're right that that's a big part of the book. So is gender. Mm -hmm. um, so is religion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so is class. I I'm also from New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and this was a story about the South. So there are all these ways that I was sort of writing about an experience that was not organically my own. It sort of wasn't, uh, um, there was not a ton of overlap, at least on the surface, between my personal experience and the experience of, of some of these characters. In fact, that was part of what made these, this story and these people so interesting to me. I mean, I'm a curious person and I'm often most curious about people who are most unlike me. I do think that that comes with a real, um, it's a, a, set, a responsibility to, to try to get it right. And a lot of learning to be a reporter and the ethics of this stuff has to do with how can I um, do this right? How can I do this well? How can I do this fairly? And so I would ask Chris Muma, um, I mean often people bring these things up, but I would ask, what's it like to be a woman in your field? Um, I might ask, I will ask Willie, uh, what's something, or one of Willie's friends, What's something I, as someone who, who comes from such a different personal experience, might not notice or might not realize? What's something I might overlook? What do um, people who don't share your experience often miss or misunderstood, misunderstand or um, get wrong? Um, you know, you're always trying to, you're trying to summon your best self. And, um, and, and that, if you do this kind of work, that means doing it not just with people who you get immediately and you share a lot in common with, but who at least on the surface um, you seem dissimilar from. Um, and you just do the most sort of responsible, decent work you're capable of. Thank you.
I found uh, Chris Mula to be an extraordinary character, person. And I just like the way you portrayed her. And I just read a book by Brian Stevenson. Stevenson. Just Mercy. Yeah, and he's another one of these characters that yeah. never gives up. Yeah. And uh, did you spend a lot of time with Chris to yeah. get to know her? Yeah, I mean, I would, I mean for, both, for a lot of these people, a lot of the main people, I would go out every few months and spend hours with them. Um, and so these aren't sort of one-off. I mean, for a peripheral character who only appears once or, my, I, or just someone who actually doesn't even appear in the narrative, but it's an informational interview, I might only meet them once. But a lot of these people I met um, repeatedly um, over months or years. And um, yeah, I mean, these are extraordinary people. Not because they are wholly virtuous or wholly evil, but because they are an extraordinary collection of qualities. And uh, Chris is a really good, a good example of that. It's such a compliment that you think enough people read my book that he's famous. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I was saying before about the Willie when he was arrested, Willie looking back on his younger self versus the Willie now. I think, the, I think Willie would say that the 41-year-old version of him would have responded to a book about himself in a, in a different way than now. I mean, the truth is, Willie has been through so much, and to get through that with his humanity intact, he had to do such vigorous interior work that the a book about him um, isn't enough to shake him, really. I mean, uh, neither was uh, a settlement of a bunch of money just didn't change the way he lived. I mean, you've got to you've got to realize that.